Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening and Ramadan Mubarak to you all. My name is Shema Iziara and I'm a creative content specialist at Qatar Foundation. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this special Ramadan edition of Qatar Foundation's Education City Speaker Series. For Muslims around the world, this month is a time of reflection. Reflection in our lives, our behaviors, our actions, and how we connect with the world and the people around us. And the spirit of reflection is also seen among people of other cultures, especially within diverse communities such as Qatar. When we talk about reflection, we often see it as referring to looking back to our deeds, choices, and decisions of the past. But reflection has a broader purpose, to spark a desire within us to make a difference, to explore and discover, to question and broaden our understanding and to recognize how we can make our voice heard when conversations turn to the aspects of life that we are most passionate about. It can be a platform for people to become drivers of meaningful change, the type of change that for more than 25 years, Qatar Foundation has been empowering people to make by providing opportunities that allow them to realize their potential and recognize the central active role they can make in shaping the future as what we call students of change. At Qatar Foundation, we believe that people are inspired to be change makers when they see how challenges can be turned into opportunities, how obstacles can be overcome, how horizons should never be limited, and how thinking big can pave the way for anyone to make a positive mark on the world. But it's not always easy to see how we can do this and how we can do it. That's why, as we celebrate Ramadan, we are devoting our latest edition of the Education City Speaker Series with a very special guest speaker to looking at how this time of reflection can be a spiritual and psychological catalyst for us all to think about how we can make meaningful and enduring change happen. For those of you who have not joined one of these events before, the Education City Speaker Series is a Qatar Foundation platform that provides people with an opportunity to hear from, learn about, and interact with experts and thought leaders on a range of topics influencing our world and impacting our lives. And tonight, we have the pleasure of welcoming to the Education City Speaker Series, the internationally renowned scholar and human rights activist, Imam Dr. Omar Suleiman. He is the founder and president of the Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research and a professor of Islamic studies at Southern Methodist University. Imam Suleiman is also the resident scholar of the Valley Ranch Islamic Center and co-chair emeritus of Faith Forward Dallas at Thanksgiving Square. It's a multi-faith coalition of clergy for peace and justice. Through his work supporting the Hurricane Katrina relief effort in New Orleans, he became recognized in the US as an advocate for community service, interfaith dialogue, and social justice. Beliefs that have seen him prominently campaign in support of US immigration reform, the rights of refugees, and victims of police brutality. He is the recipient of the United Nations Global Goals Award with Faith Forward Dallas, and has been named by CNN as one of the 25 most influential Muslims in America. So we are delighted that he's with us tonight to share his thoughts over the next 40 minutes on how Ramadan and the reflection it brings can light the spark of change and to then take your questions in a 20 minute question and answer session. Please use the Q&A section of this webinar to post your questions and we'll get through as many as possible. And just a reminder, if you're watching on Microsoft Teams, there is live translation in English, Arabic, French, Spanish and Italian. You can also tune in on QF's YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter channels. And if you want to post about the discussion on your social media channels, it would be great if you can use the hashtags EC Speaker Series and Students of Change. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Imam Dr. Omar Suleiman. Dr. Omar, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, Dr. Amar, you're muted. Okay. I, I thought it would take a while to, to mess up the mute and unmute, but alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Jazakumullah khairan Ramadan mubarak to all of you. Thank you so much. 
Um, I want to begin with asking you about your own experience of affecting change. When and how did you realize that this was something that you had within you to do? And how do you feel that the teaching of Islam have influenced your character, your values, your actions, and the direction that you have taken as a change maker? Um, that question is actually, you know, subhanAllah, one that uh, I, I look back and I say that I was fortunate to actually have, you know, change makers in my own home, my, my parents. I looked to my parents and I saw, you know, Islam embodied in their actions, uh, both my mother and my father. My mother, may Allah have mercy on her, was a poet, a humanitarian. Um, she was uh, just an incredible human being. And she, you know, she embodied so much of, of what um, I, I still strive to be today. Uh, my father was uh, a professor, a, a a debater. He was someone that was a caretaker. He also sort of bought into this entire idea that you are here not for yourself, but for everything but yourself, so long as it is praised by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala who put you here. And so, you know, growing up, it was very common to see you know refugees suddenly be in the house that are going to spend you know a few months with us. Uh, it was common. Uh, for uh, for my parents to actually even donate like all of our cars and not have any transportation um, for some time. And so I saw that embodied. And I think that that's actually something that's very important is that when you're talking about, you know, people in the past, oftentimes they seem so inaccessible because they're almost superhuman, right? But when you're actually able to see examples of people that embody those values and embody that glorious tradition that has been passed down generation after generation, and that gives you something to strive for. And I think, you know, the Prophet said, In every generation of my ummah, there are forerunners, there are people that are trendsetters. Change, however, has to be in accordance with a healthy route because not all change is good. And what I lean on is one of my favorite ayat in the Quran uh, is in Surah Ibrahim. Alam tara kayfa darab Allahu mathalan kalimatan tayyibatan kashajaratin tayyiba asluha thabit wa faruha fi sama tuti ukulaha kullahin bi idni rabbiha. Allah talks about the example of faith as a tree, and He said it's like a firmly rooted tree, asluha thabit, and the tree is la ilaha illallah. So it's the testimony of faith, asluha thabit wa faruha fi sama. Its foundation is firm and its branches are in the sky and it is constantly producing its fruit. And so the tree of faith is not seasonal, it's consistent. That's number one. That's what we take from this. Most trees are seasonal, if not all trees are seasonal, right? The tree of faith gives at all times. It just might produce more in Ramadan and in certain seasons, right? But it's always producing. It never stops producing. But change then is in two directions. Either change, positive change at least, is in making the roots healthier and firmer. So digging them deeper into our hearts because the heart is the soil. So digging those roots deeper into our hearts or expanding the branches because faith provides comfort to everyone that is around you. And so as a believer, you are to be impacting society in every way with your Iman, with your faith. And so everyone around you should be feeling uh, the impact of what faith is doing to your heart. So what is being done to your heart should be done to society and everything around you, shaded, comforted by you, um, and tasting the fruits of your own faith. And so deeper and wider is what we learn from the Quran. And that's something that, you know, I would hope to try to live by. Um, and I, and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us all to be able to get deeper with our roots of faith in Ramadan and to expand further so that our branches are even wider bit than I taught and even more impactful. Inshallah. I mean, um, as we said at the start of this event, we are now in the month of Ramadan and experiencing the opportunities for reflection that it offers us. For many Muslims around the world, Ramadan is truly when we elevate our efforts to embody makarim al-akhlaq, the highest morals and values, as well as the qualities that we wish to see in ourselves all year long at both a personal and a spiritual level. So how does this holy month, both generally and through its specific uh, practices of, for example, fasting and taraweeh prayers, how does it provide opportunities and catalysts for life-lasting change? 
So um, I'll, I'll merge this with the first question, which is that my personal journey to faith and through faith has been a complete certitude that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is indeed the Prophet of God, right? And that's something with my own journey of reading Dalal al Nabuwa, the proofs of prophethood, you know, like that was something that really solidified Islam in my heart. Because when you study his life, it's like there is no way he was not a prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And one of the greatest proofs of his prophethood is, is his character. And the thing about his character Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that people objected to him not being an angel, right? They said, how come uh, you're not an angel? How come, you know, why doesn't Allah just send down the book uh, with four angels testifying to it? You know, like, and we can see the book and we can touch it. Um, and we can see this magic in front of our eyes. But what makes the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu so special is that he sets the standard in literally every phase of life, in your individual life, in your family life, in your societal life, whether you're a leader or a follower, a host or a guest, you know, whatever you are, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I was only sent to perfect good character. And so, as a worshiper of Allah, as a family person, as an individual, he is all around Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the standard. So what that does is it gives us an opportunity to constantly strive to meet the standard and we're always gonna fall short, right? We're never gonna be as good as him in anything in life, but we're always going to have something to strive for. So in Ramadan, if you think about what we're doing in Ramadan, we are basically trying to emulate his worship Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Jibreel alayhi salam would come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and would read the Quran with him every night uh, in Ramadan. We're trying to read the Quran every night in Ramadan. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would pray all night long, and in the last ten nights in particular, he would tie his waist belt sallallahu alayhi wasallam, right? Which means that it was it was another level of worship. Uh, we're not going to get to worship like he did sallallahu alayhi wasallam, but we'll try, right? We're going to pray at night. He was alayhi salatu wasalam ajwa al nas the most generous of people. But when Ramadan came, he was more generous than a, than a blowing wind, right? A hurricane of generosity. So we'll try to be generous as well. So we're trying to rise to, 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 to meet as much as we can of what the Prophet ﷺ left for us as an example. Now, what makes Ramadan so important at the spiritual level is Ramadan allows us to be more aware of ourselves. It allows us to be more focused on Allah. And that's a combination that is just, that, that's a powerful combination. More aware of ourselves because we're thinking about our intake. We're thinking about our intake in terms of food and drink and, 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 and things that are ordinarily halal to us. And we're also now more conscious of our intake in the spiritual sense, which is really, the, you know, an objective of Ramadan. So we're thinking about what the poisons, the spiritual poisons that we usually put into our lives that hinder our spiritual productivity. All the while we're filling ourselves up with, you know, we're drinking the, the, the worship of the Quran, the recitation of the Quran, the prayer. We're nourishing ourselves with all of that to keep ourselves focused on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, focused on the afterlife. And so what we learn about Taskiyah spirituality in Islam is that it's more about often what you don't do than what you do do. And that's something that if you if you look at change in general, right, it's bad habits that usually stop you from reaching your potential. In the spiritual sense, taqwa, uh, piety, is to abandon that which is displeasing to Allah, tark al ma'asi, because those things that are displeasing to Allah hinder you from your pursuit of being the best version of yourself. And so you have to put those things aside. So you're self aware and you're becoming more focused and aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then you have the roadmap, right? And the last thing I'll say in this regard about Ramadan, most religious traditions when you study them um their seasons of worship contain an a unique act of worship that is only found within that season of worship okay in ramadan what are we doing we're simply increasing in the things that we're supposed to be doing throughout the year we don't like pull out a book that we only read in ramadan right we don't have a prayer that we only pray in ramadan tarawih is just the amal it's night it's the night prayer right um fasting is an act of worship throughout the year Ramadan is only mentioned one time in the Qur'an. That in and of itself is a powerful sign because the entire Qur'an revolves around a life, or the, the entire Qur'an revolves around anchoring a person in a lifestyle that's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is 
that is constantly focused in that direction. So Ramadan is just to boost us and to get us more focused and further ahead so that we can become the best version of ourselves, inshallah, and maintain consistent habits after Ramadan to where we don't completely decline uh, as, as you know, as usually the problem, the Ramadan withdrawal, post-Ramadan withdrawal, where we, where we lose all of the good that we have attained in Ramadan and then pick up the bad that we were supposed to leave behind before Ramadan. Going off from um, the same point of self-awareness and focusing on the self, uh, Dr. Omar in Ayah 11 of Surah Al-Rab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change what is in themselves. Can you please explain this concept of taking the change that we achieve at a personal level and then magnifying it into change that um, covers the community or our society? And also, is the concept of change understood differently through an Islamic lens? Um, including through the way that it is uh, referred to in the Quran and how can people of other cultures and religions beyond Islam still relate to that concept? Okay, uh, I think that stories often help people remember these things. So I'll, I'll, give, I'll give one of my favorite stories about change here, right? About advice on change. There is a particular companion of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam named Abdullah ibn Abbas Abdullah ibn Abbas was like the most accomplished uh, person that you could meet, right? I mean, he's 13 years old and he's known as the scholar of the ummah, the scholar of this deen. Uh, they said, you know, anytime he opened his mouth, he'd say the most eloquent of people when he spoke the most knowledgeable of people. Anything he did, عنه, you just said, Ibn Abbas achieved what, you know, what you would want to achieve as a person, right? Uh, his home became the first university of Islam. People would come to his house to take knowledge from him. And he really was was stunning in that sense, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Like, how did you accomplish so much at such a young age? And so people would go to him for advice, right? Uh, so if I could interview, you know, like I think about interviewing Sahaba, okay, if I could interview the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu like I'd have a very set, uh, specific set of questions for each one because you can pick gems from all of them, right? That that really are transformative to you. There are stars, right? So a man comes to Ibn Abbas and he said, I want to affect change. I want to change society. I want to enjoin good and I want to forbid evil. He said, okay, but before you do that, three verses that you have to apply from the Quran. He said, okay. He said, the first one is, do you enjoin the people with good and forget yourselves? And you're reciting the book, you're reciting the verses, but you're not practicing the verses. Aren't you, you know, do, are, do you not think about that? Do you not comprehend? So he said, do you think you've adequately uh, applied that? He said, uh, probably not. He said, okay. Oh, you who believe, why do you say, why do you say that which you don't do? The most heinous of crimes in the sight of God, the most heinous of sins in the sight of God, is that you do, you say that which you don't do. So hypocrisy, basically, right? And he said, no. He said, okay. And remember when Shu'aib told his people that I do not command you to do anything except that I do it myself. So this is a powerful uh, effect of change that as believers, what we see is that change starts not just with you. It starts with a very particular part of you, your heart. Right, And if your heart is good, the entire jasad, the entire body becomes good. And so you correct your heart, you rectify your heart, and then the rest of your actions follow suit. And then you bring that to your home, right? Those that are closest to you are most deserving of seeing your goodness, your kindness. So you bring life to your house, the life of faith to your house, of change to your house. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, someone reminded me of this when we were talking about the last 10 nights of Ramadan, and we're not quite there yet, but um, that as as dedicated as he was to his own worship, he used to go and wake up his family members every single night. So he wouldn't forget his family members in the midst of his own you know, personal journey to Allah, and those were the 10 nights that he exerted himself the most. He would go and wake them up as well. And then you have societal change from a family because a community is made up of families. And you think about some of the most transformative communities in history, and it's a family or two. 
Like, you know, if, if you come to particularly the United States and you go to most of the masajid, most of the mosques and the, and the Muslim communities that have been established here, how did it start off? It was a family or two, right? A couple of families, three families that got together and they started to build something. They started to impact and affect change in their society. So it's it starts inward and then you go outward and you never forget inward. So that's another very important concept in Islam. You've never arrived. Like, it's never like, you know, I got to a point now where I can just preach and I can abandon my own personal development. You never get to a point where you're no longer developing yourself personally. You never get to a point where you can just preach and not practice. You never get to a point where I can, you know, I, I think my family's set now. Anyone that has kids will tell you that you're in for a rude awakening because your child is going <laughs> to change personalities every year. I can just move on to the next one now and, and okay, let me just work on society now. It's always looking, you know, starting inward and going outward. You never abandon your heart. You never abandon your heart. SubhanAllah, the Prophet said, Sometimes I feel a fog over my heart. So that's why I seek forgiveness from Allah at least a hundred times, right? I mean, every day. And so um, that is something that the Prophet teaches us that you have to keep on feeding your soul and with a well-replenished soul, you can replenish society. Uh, there's the famous saying, right? The one who doesn't have can't give. So you have to think about your heart as your spiritual reservoir, right? And you're feeding your spiritual reservoir. And then with that reservoir, you, you can give to the rest of the world, right? So never at any point, at any point, do you neglect yourself in pursuit of the betterment of society. You better yourself, and through that betterment of self, you better society. And then you constantly refine yourself in the process until you meet your Lord. And you know, that, that's something, by the way, that even from outside of just the realm of spirituality, this idea that, you know, your capacity is limited as a human being. Now, when you have a sense of purpose, your capacity is expanded, right? When you have, like, meaningful prayer and connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your, your capacity is expanded. But everyone has a capacity. And so that capacity shrinks. It shrinks if you don't replenish yourself. And at some point, you burn out. And a burnt out version of yourself is not good for anybody, right? It's a collapse of yourself and it's and it's a collapse of your potential to everyone and everything that's around you. And so you have to to, to expand yourself. And, um, you know, the last verse I'll share in this regard, uh, something very powerful is that every time Qiyamul Layl, the night prayer is mentioned in the Quran, then charity is mentioned in the day right afterwards. So you pray at night and then you give in charity during the day. And one of the, so, you know, كَانُوا قَلِيلًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ مَا يَهْجَعُونَ وَبِالْأَسْحَارِ هُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ وَفِي أَمْوَارِهِمْ حَقُّ النِّسَارِ وَالْمَحْرُونَ So they used to spend a little bit of their nights only a little bit of their nights in, in sleep. They used to pray at night and they would seek forgiveness from their Lord at the time of suhoor, the time right before Fajr. And then during the day they would spend on people that would ask and people that did not even ask. And so what that means is that at night you, you, you spend time alone with your Lord and that replenishes you. And then during the day you serve people. Uh, you, you, you activate yourself in accordance with what you are filling yourself with uh, at night. And so that's that's something that I just leave people with is that your capacity is very important. You can't neglect any element of yourself uh, that is going to that, that is going to end up depleting you as a person and as a productive member of society as well. As you said, um, the journey of self-improvement and feeding our souls is a long and continuous one. So how challenging do you believe it is to create that sustainable change that we're talking about? And how can we in our own lives and in our own communities and societies try to ensure that the change that we hope to make endures and brings a lasting benefit to others? All right, so another story then uh, from another companion, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, radiallahu uh, anhumah. So, Abdullah ibn Amr was also a young companion, and he he's one of those three people, according to the, the commentators of hadith, that came to the house of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and they asked Aisha radiallahu anha, you know, does he ever sleep at night? Does he ever break his fast? Does he ever, you know, like, 
basically, you know, they, they asked about the Prophet ﷺ's habits, and when they found that even the Prophet of Allah Alayhi salatu wasalam, had balanced habits. Uh, they said, okay, one of them said, I'm, I'm not going to ever get married. The other one said, I'm going to fast, never break my fast. The other one said, I'm going to pray all night, never sleep. And the Prophet wasalam, was not happy about that. He said, whoever turns away from my sunnah is not from me, from my methodology is not from me. Why? Were, weren't there nights that the Prophet wasalam, just did pray all night? Uh, were there days that the Prophet wasalam's fast just occupied him throughout the entire day? Yes. But the Prophet wasalam, understood that change that is temporary can actually even be negative like it can actually be a problem it's not just it's not just a good thing it can actually it's just it's not sorry it's not just not a good thing it can actually be a bad thing uh, and if you think about like um you know it's always good to use like examples of uh, of, of uh, physical discipline right like if you try to, to 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 crash diet like you go on an extreme diet you know for a week you're most likely going to gain all that weight back and more if you if you try to lift weights and do fitness right then <laughs> and you try to go for like the hardest stuff right away you're not going to be able to lift anything you build yourself up to a certain point where where things become more attainable uh, all of these things are are in the physical realm so anyway abdullah ibn amr uh, was a young man that uh, you know he came into islam later uh, because of his father and he wanted to just get it all at one time and so he kept on trying to do more and more and more and more to a point that the Prophet Sallallahu saw a young man that was going to burn out, okay? And uh, I, and his father uh, even complains about him to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about the way that he is, he, he is uh, taking this path. And it's really interesting because it's like, how many parents would love to be able to complain, like, you know, bring bring the kid to Sheikh and say, yeah, Sheikh, my, my kid reads too much Quran. I don't know what to do. He reads Quran all the time. He's finishing the Quran every day. He's praying all night. I don't know what to do with this kid, right? It's not like playing video games all day and all night. It's praying all night. And in fact, when he got married, um, Abdullah ibn Amr, you know, when, when you get married, you're supposed to uh, pray two rak'ahs on, on the night of your wedding with your spouse. Those two rak'ahs, you, you read, you know, short surahs, right? Or some, some, some not so long in length. He did the whole Quran. <laughs> and... So uh, Amr, his father, asked her, the wife of Abdullah ibn Amr, like, how is your husband? How is my son as a husband to you? She said, uh, abid. He's a great worshiper. She didn't say he's a bad husband. He's a great worshiper. MashaAllah, a great worshiper. And that's when the Prophet Sallallahu intervened. And he told Abdullah ibn Amr, do not be like a man. Don't be like that person who used to pray all night and then they left it all off. We've all seen people dive so quickly and try to get it all in at one time to where they just crash and burn and they end up leaving everything off, right? Don't be that person who used to, who says, I remember one day I used to do this and I remember one day I used to do that. That's not healthy. It's not good for your faith. It's not good for your spirituality. It's going to depress you and deplete you. So be a person that is steady in their journey to Allah. And I end with this hadith from the Prophet ﷺ on this question. He said, alayhi salatu wasalam, inna li kulli shay'in shirra, wa li kulli shirratin fatra. Faman kanat fatratuhu ila sunnati faqad ihtada, wa man kanat ila ghayri dhalik faqad halak. Or kama qara alayhi salatu wasalam, he said that everything has a peak, and then every peak has its course, it runs its course. So you have your high point and you have your low point. Prophet ﷺ said, whoever has their low point in accordance with the methodology of my sunnah, what I have brought, then they will succeed. And whoever seeks in any other way, they will collapse. And what he meant by that وسلم, is that a healthy high point is when you are you know, abandoning that which is displeasing, that which is prohibited, that which is not positive. And um, you are engaging in that which is obligatory and good and, and voluntary and building and building in a steady way. And an unhealthy one is when, you know, a person at their low point not only abandons the extra things they used to do, but they abandon the obligatory things they should be doing. Not only does not engage in the praiseworthy anymore, but they engage in the sinful in their low point. So like one night I'm in the masjid, the next night I'm in the opposite of a masjid, right? Because I just, I collapsed. So the lesson for us is that the Prophet ﷺ taught us to be disciplined in everything. 
And you can't be disciplined in anything unless you're disciplined in everything. There's no concept in Islam that you can be reckless with your family and still be good as an individual. That you can be, you know, reckless uh, emotionally or physically and still be good spiritually. Like, no, Allah created you as a whole part, right? As a whole person. And you have to, you have to be disciplined in everything that you do. And then the Prophet Sallallahu taught us gradual change. Gradual change. Because gradual change is lasting. And the most beloved of deeds to God are the ones that are consistent, even if they are small, because they will last with you for a lifetime. That is such an important point. Balance is always key. Um, before we move on, I just want to remind our audiences that you can post your questions for Dr. Ahmed on the Q&A section of this webinar, and we'll aim to ask him as many as we can. But first, Dr. Ahmed, I'd like to turn to the backdrop against which we are marking Ramadan this year. And that backdrop, of course, being the COVID-19 pandemic and the necessary restrictions that it has placed on so many people's lives, including those observing the holy month uh, this year. So. How do you feel both Muslims and non-Muslims can benefit from the spiritual nature of Ramadan as they look to deal with the stress and anxiety that COVID-19 continues to cause? And how difficult is it to maintain a sense of spirituality in such challenging times? Look, it has been a really, really difficult year. Um, I, I don't want to diminish it um, in any way, but it has been very tough to to encounter just the scope of death that we have encountered like for me when i think of COVID, i'm not just thinking about quarantining and, and face masks and thinking about the people that we lost this last year subhanallah so many people in my own community here we were burying sometimes multiple people a day um alhamdulillah it has slowed down now but it has been a very difficult time um you know, in terms of the uh, the funerals and in terms of the losses that we have had. And I think that it is a wake up call for us to, to really to take a step back and to reflect on, you know, the meaning of life and the purpose of life and that there is more to it than this world. You know, anything that reminds us of the fragility of this world or our own vulnerability is an opportunity to cling to that which is permanent and that which is more meaningful when and the hereafter is better and more lasting to strive for that which is more meaningful which is more purposeful and so i think that you know um it's a time for us to actually um be heightened in our awareness of what type of life we want to live and what type of life we want to go to and what type of impact we want to leave behind um, and what type of deeds we want to see ahead of us. Like it's an opportunity for us to really, really take a step back because ultimately, honestly, I think of the people that I lost, uh, that we lost, and I say, I can't wait to see them again, inshallah, because I really want to be united with those people. Um, I can't wait to see them. And I think they were righteous people. A lot of them were just righteous people. And I pray that Allah allows us to follow in the path of the righteous. So it's a wake up call. Um, to be more intentional. There's a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu um, in this regard, which I think is helpful to everyone, okay? Just the advice is so profound and it fits the COVID background of Ramadan. Uh, he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to pray, Sallu Salat al pray as if it is your last prayer. Pray as if it is your last prayer. So don't treat your prayer as if, you know, don't take your prayer for granted. You know, we talk about blessings, not taking blessings for granted, the blessing of prayer. You know, don't take your prayer for granted. This might be your last time praying. Don't say something today you'll have to apologize for tomorrow. Like our relatives, our families, how many relationships did we sever? Do we break and we say, I'll make up with them one day? Right? No, no, no. Don't 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 say today what you'll have to apologize for tomorrow. Don't expect that you're going to have a chance at reconciliation because when you're in the midst of an argument or a dispute, and I'm telling people in Ramadan in particular, solve your disputes now. Reconcile, especially with your family members. If you have broken relationships right now, try to reconcile in Ramadan right now. The time is perfect because when you're in the midst of a heated dispute, 
uh, you're going to be pushed to say the most hurtful thing possible because you want to win the argument, right? And then after the dispute, your ego will hold you back from actually from actually reconciling. No, don't say something today that you'll have to apologize for tomorrow. You don't know. And we've seen how rapid, subhanAllah, death can be for, for people, right? You don't know. You don't know. You don't want to carry that burden after a person passes away of not having reconciled and resolved your disputes. And then the Prophet said, said, uh, and and lose hope or despair in what other people possess. They don't care about what other people possess. So many of us spend our lives so unhappy because no matter what we have in this life, we're looking to what we don't have and what that other person has. And so I want to get what that person has. I want to get what that person has. I want to get what that person has. Here's what we're both going to have. We're both going to have death. And I don't say that in a grim and a grotesque way. I'm saying that life is temporary. Okay. That, uh, whether your wedding was this big and that person's wedding was this big yeah. or your car is this and that person's car is that or your house is this and that person's house is that or that person's life seems so glamorous and your life seems so yeah. not glamorous compared to the three pictures they post every day <laughs> on social media um you're both going to end up in the same place as far as this world is concerned however your trajectory in the afterlife is unlimited in terms of potential for you and so focus and don't be unhappy about what you don't have in this life lose hope in it i don't care you know alhamdulillah for what i have and ramadan should be teaching us that like alhamdulillah there are people in the world that don't have anything to break their fast with like that's a reality that's not some made-up fiction like in the year 1300 or 14 no like now there are people in the world that don't have anything to break their fast with alhamdulillah uh, so you live a more uh, 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 you live a more purposeful life, and happiness is a byproduct of that. And COVID has taught us to prioritize, right? Like think about what your blessings actually are. Think about what it is that you actually want to keep with you, and what actually will transpire in something meaningful for you going forward. And don't wait till you're old. Uh, I especially say this to the youth. Look, I mean, one thing you study with with people that are productive. In life and that have accomplished whether in the in the religious sense or the worldly sense uh is they they really started young and they kept going right like you you, you meet athletes professional athletes they've been at it since their youth right and they've been doing the same thing it's been repetitive and routine it's been a part of their lives uh when you're young is the perfect chance for you to actually dedicate yourself you know a lot of people wait to to, to do what you know once they once it's been abundantly made abundantly clear uh that that life is temporary and you know you've started to see people that you love go and um you know what allah calls in the quran and nadir the warning sign which are the gray hairs that start to pop up right once all that starts to happen um then then a lot of people say all right well now i'm going to focus on religiosity i got what i wanted out of this world no like your your sincerity to your cause is that you choose it in the prime of your ability to pursue what's what's folly and what's what's superficial that's like your real testimony to allah like yeah it's all available to me but you know what i'm happier with that which is more purposeful and more meaningful in life so don't wait till you're older to try to make that change because there might not be an older and for those of you that are older it's not too late for you <laughs> because you're still here and we also see people that turn the page at, in their in their elder uh, in their in their elder years, and were able to really you know make right what was done wrong for so many years of their lives. So the point is, the fact that you're alive right now means you shouldn't despair. But the fact that you've seen so much despair should make you reconsider how to live your life. Dr. Omar, this has been a wonderful session, and I know we have a lot of questions from our audience waiting for you. Uh, but before we move to them, I want to ask one final question myself. Um, in any person's life, there can be a lot of points at which uh, the desire to be a change maker is ignited. Um, and maybe you touched a little bit on, on that when you talked about the youth starting young. I wanna, would love to hear more about that. So what would be your advice to people about what they should do when this desire ignites and, and what they should do when they encounter obstacles to being a driver of change? So um, thank you for the question. Uh, and I want to be very, very thoughtful about it since it's the last question in our in our discussion at least. 
Uh, I want to remind everyone first and foremost, make sure your change is sincere. Uh, your desire for change is sincere. It's coming from the right place and make sure that it is changing in the right ways. Um, too many times we, 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 um, uh, we mix, we conflate influence with impact, influence with impact. And so I want to be a change maker means I'm out front. I'm speaking. I've got the stage. I've got the podium. I've got this. I'm very visible. Some of the most impactful people in life were behind the scenes their entire lives. But Allah knew who they were and Allah knew their deeds. And Allah wrote down everything they put forth. Allah wrote down their effect, their impact. Allah wrote it down. And so make sure that your desire for for change is not a desire to be seen as a change maker. That's very important. So make sure it's sincere. Because a lot of times, you know, people just package righteousness into the same, um, you know, desire uh, to be uh, to, to be validated by other people. Uh, influence should come as a result of impact. It should not be a cover for what is actually not impactful at all. All right. So impact. And I also remind people your legacy in life is not how you're going to be remembered in this world. Your legacy is how you're going to be resurrected in the next. So the whole concept of legacy and impact, again, keep your, keep yourself focused on that which is not bounded by the realms of this world, okay? Uh, we, we believe in something that transcends this world. So that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing that I would say is make sure that you are, uh, as, as, as you're seeking to take that, that goal forward, that anything that you do that is public, is matched by an increase in private devotion. The more you teach, the more you need to be learning. The more you preach, the more you need to be practicing. The more you're seen by other people doing good, the more you need to be seen only by Allah doing good at times, right? Like your devotion should be should, should be matching your growth there. And the last thing that I will say in this regard is, um, that don't despair you know the prophet said uh, both of them are authentically narrated that whoever says the people have no hope is the one that is causing them to be hopeless or he is the most hopeless of them all uh, there is something called a, a analysis paralysis you know analysis paralysis is where you analyze the world so much that you're paralyzed and you don't do anything so the world is so messed up and look this is happening here and this is happening here and you know uh you're you're on whatsapp all the time talking about how bad the world is or on your own social media and you're constantly circling the world is this the world is that everyone is corrupt everyone is bad everyone is this and you're not changing your own world you're not making change in your own in your own space and it could be that the change that you make in your own space ends up changing that world that you're complaining about. So, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu taught us to, uh, to never despair, never despair. So change is meaningful, even if it appears to be small, because you don't know what Allah is going to make out of that small. So, you know, work in your own capacity, work on your own self, work in your own family, work in your own community. Don't belittle what you are doing. Don't belittle any good deed that you're doing. Because Allah may make something out of it. And by the way, you might not even live to see it. How many people, um, you know, planted the seeds for something great and died before they were able to see it in this life? But guess what? It's preserved if it was sincere, right? So on the day of judgment, they will see it, bi'nillahi ta'ala. And we pray that we are sincere in uh, seeking to implement change, that all of us find that sincerity to implement change in accordance with you know, uh, the, the blessed methodology that's been given to us from our Prophet Wasallam that we implement change in our individual lives and in our family lives and our community lives. And that ultimately, you know, we're seen as, uh, as, as people of righteousness in the sight of the one uh, who it matters most. Thank you, Dr. Omar. Um, I'd like now to turn to some of the questions from our audience. And the first question we have is from Microsoft Teams. It says, how can we as Muslims enact change through an Islamic framework and show the virtues of Islam when there's so much criticism of our morals and ethics and our religion? And another related note from Ali on also teams, 
what barriers to positive change have you experienced in your life and how did you overcome them? Okay, so the first question is, um, you know, when, when there's so much criticism of, you know, Islamic morals and, and values and uh, our own ethics, um, I think that we need to spend less time defending our morals and more time acting upon them. That doesn't mean that there isn't value in deconstructing um, the ideologies that undermine or undercut, um, you know, our, our Islam and our Islamic framework. Uh, I think that's important. There's a role for that. And I think it's important for us to intellectually engage Islamic frameworks. We have a history in Islam of giving to civilization, right? We have a history of contribution. That's not a made up, it's not a fabricated history. It's not an exaggerated history, right? Civilization owes a great debt to Muslim scholars and change makers throughout history that have got us to where we are today. And they did not champion those contributions in spite of their Islam, many times it was because of their Islam. They felt activated by their Islam to find their genius in the sciences, to find their geniuses in contribution, to find their geniuses in all of these different things. And so your Islam is to activate you um, towards those things. And so, uh, yes, look, we're going to be criticized. We're going to be told um, that our, our our ways are regressive, that our ways are outdated, that our religion is archaic. We're going to be told all of these things. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, the foam will wash away and that which is beneficial to the people will stay. This is what Allah tells us. Uh, and there's no greater benefit than that which comes from uh, our own deen that we can champion. So I would say is live the best example of the morals and ethics that you believe in. Champion them, live with them, uh, work with them, work in accordance with them. And if some people don't like it, then that's fine. I'm, I'm not gonna waste, I'm, I'm really, and I'm not saying that in a condescending way towards it, but it's like, why waste your time, right? Like trying to, uh, trying to tell them that you should be taken seriously or that you should be considered. No, just just be yourself in accordance with your deen. Uh, work and uh, work and make sure that it's sincere and that it's steadfast and that it's in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Have constant shura, consultation, have people around you. Reassess, reevaluate and move. And um, like I said, you know, it might be that you don't see the benefit of your effort now, but it may be that someone picks up where you left off. Uh, there's a, a hadith the Prophet said, Astaq al Asma al Harith wal Hammam. The most truthful of names are al Harith and al Hammam. Al Harith is the one that plows the field, al Hammam is the one that grows the crops. You might be the Harith, even if you're trying to be the Hammam. <laughs> you might be plowing the field and planting seeds, and someone else is going to come grow it later. Uh, so we have a deen that has sur survived and thrived over 14 hundred years of all sorts of challenges and currents and times where we thought, you know, uh, every generation thought like this was it. And alhamdulillah, the deen survived and the deen thrived and the deen gave back. So give back with your religion, live with your religion and live with your faith in the most inspired way and steadfast way. Uh, and overcoming in my own life, look, it's a constant work in progress. Um, I, I, you've never arrived, subhanAllah, like I constantly am um, in, in a place of trying to think about, you know, what could have been said better, what could have been done better, um, and trying to overcome that. And it becomes very challenging, of course, when you are living amongst um, other people that, you know, operate with a different set of values and things of that sort, right? So uh, the challenges are going to be there, and um, it's important to be sincere, to constantly revisit um, with your mentors, with your, with your shura, with your consultation, with you know, with your prayer, right? And to think about how you can move forward. Um, and, at, and at the end of the day, you know, uh, you, you're supposed to do what you're supposed to do. Um, Allah does his part, you do your part. So we get too caught up sometimes in success. Like we want to see our efforts give fruit. And if they don't give fruit in front of us, then we start to think they're failures. No, you're supposed to just do your part. Let Allah do his at that point. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Omar. Um, our next question is from Fauzia from Microsoft Teams as well. Um, and she says, how can we instill a healthy attitude towards change in children? 
Um, how can we ensure they build positive habits that are based on values from a younger age? And what is your advice to parents, especially with all the distractions and the temptations that might distance children from their faith? SubhanAllah. So this is one where I, I like will totally admit that I am a struggling and panicky parent all the time, right? So Alhamdulillah, my oldest is 11. Um, and, uh, you know, I have uh, 11 year old and eight year old and, and about to be two year old. My 11 year old sometimes feels like a 13 year old. My eight year old feels like a 10 year old. My two year old feels like she's the boss of the house. Um, I think many uh, young parents might be able to relate. Uh, one thing that I will say um, is that it's important to um, to trace blessings back uh, to you know uh, to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala when you're nurturing your kids, right? So when good things happen to them, uh, when when they see blessings, to remind them to be grateful, to connect them back to the source of those blessings. The other thing is teaching them from a very young age in action how Islam makes you better people. Um, so that's something I mentioned about my own parents, right? Like I could see in my parents what Islam looked like manifested and I could trace their goodness back to their faith. And so that made me want what they had, you know? And, and so like if, if your, your kids see you first and foremost, by the way, um, how you treat their other parent, <laughs> uh, first and foremost, how you treat their mother, how you treat their father, right? How you treat the other parent. Like they see that manifested, that goodness manifested, and then they see that manifest in the way you treat them. Look, we're, we are, we are, um, as has been mentioned, constantly under attack, and and you know under you know this idea that we operate with a, with an inferior set of values. We have to show how those values actually in charge or, or charge us and, and and move us to the best version of ourselves, to where it's just indisputable that Islam makes us within our, our, our family, um, you know, uh, just just a more connected units with each other and a more connected unit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a more beneficial group of people. So uh, remind them of their blessings constantly and remind them to be a blessing to other people and let them see Islam in action. Let them see goodness from you and you make sure that just like you're teaching them that the source of their blessings is Allah, that the source of any goodness that they're seeing from you um, is from you're learning from the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wonderful. Um, our next question is, how are uh, spirituality and ability to excel in physical acts of worship related? Um, for example, there are people who are able to easily incorporate healthy habits into their lives, but struggle when it comes to being consistent in their daily prayers and vice versa. And why is that? Well, sometimes it's motivation, sometimes it's methodology, you know, like, so yes, there are people that can excel in some ways in their lives and then, you know, they, they, they end up uh, crashing in other ways of their lives. So I would say that with spirituality, you know, like we find guidance from the Prophet Sallallahu on everything that we do, right? Including, right, how we, uh, how we consume, how we eat, how we drink and, and so on and so forth. So we find guidance from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi in that regard. So a person, you know, might excel in some other ways to the detriment of their spirituality, but you're not going to be able to excel with your spirituality and, and neglect everything else. That's just not possible. Now, we are different people. So like motivations have to be there. And then sometimes it's just a matter of setting your habits right. Habits right. So, for example, you know, like I, I was just sharing some hello with some people, like one of the most. Uh, one thing that I've started experimenting with, which I'm finding really, really is to actually plug all of my obligations and all of my uh, everything that I want to accomplish in one calendar. You know, most people set like their work calendar from everything else. Ramadan teaches us to plan around Salah, like in Maghrib time when they're fasting. <laughs> so you're.
check it whenever you finish, just like you would do anything else. If that's your tool of productivity, then 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 make sure that your religious obligations are not put to the side and then, oh, well, I couldn't get to this and it's extra anyway. Put it all together. Uh, the last thing I'll say in this regard is um, outside of Ramadan, when it comes to the pursuit of the voluntary, um, that's where, you know, really customizing your own your own way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not in a way that departs from the sunnah, everything has to be in accordance with the way of the Prophet ﷺ, but customizing in the sense that your schedule um, and the deeds, the voluntary deeds that you that you uh, that you plan to engage in at a different proportion, that might change. Uh, so for example, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he, uh, he was asked why he doesn't fast too much voluntary. Uh, days and he's such a great companion so why doesn't he fast so many days outside of Ramadan and he said in Qur'an he said like for me you know my physical being like it's fasting diminishes for me the ability to read and teach Qur'an at the late at, at, at the level that I do and reading Qur'an is more beloved to me than fasting so he was teaching Quran all the time, so he chose not to engage fasting voluntary days too much, but he replaced it with a lot of voluntary teaching and recitation of the Quran. So people are going to be different in that regard after the obligations are met. And uh, moving to our last question for today, uh, what advice can you give for people who struggle to put aside stress during acts of worship? Uh, for example, a stress of university assignments and family and so on. See it, look, as an act of worship to do those things with ihsan, with excellence. Allah has written ihsan for everything, excellence for everything. Setting your affairs right uh, can be done with the right intention and can be done with excellence and ihsan. Uh, even putting food on the table can be an act of worship. Um, even taking exams can be an act of worship. <laughs> yeah, even attaining your degree can be an act of worship. Um, all of that can be an act of worship. So it is, it, it, it is natural that each one of us is going to have a varied level of stress factors in our lives. Um, acting with those stress factors in accordance with the way that our religion calls us to act is an act of worship. So if I'm going to act in a noble way and in a consistent way and with noble intentions and purposeful intentions with those things, then that is actually an act of worship. I shouldn't separate it from everything else. Thank you all so much for your questions and I'm sorry we cannot get around to more of them, but I'm afraid our time has run out. But before we close, Dr. Omar, I'd just like to ask you to briefly share your final thoughts or words of advice uh, to the audience joining us today from around the world. You know, it's always harder when it's general. Um, I would say, you know, as just a final word of advice, truly, subhanAllah, treat this Ramadan as, as if it's your last Ramadan. Um, that's not, you know, usually you find salat salat and wadir, pray as if it's your last prayer, but Ramadan is so special. And there are so many people that I know, and that I'm sure other people here know, that would have loved another Ramadan that didn't make it. Um, this is such a special month of heightened spirituality, of connection to Allah. Don't let it go to waste. You don't know, it might be your last time that you get to fast this month, that you get to stand in prayer this month. Um, so really make the most of the Ramadan. Um, look immediately within it in the Nahi Ta'ala and find find your your path to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and make your commitment from now uh, to change and make it very concrete. These are three things I want to look different about me after Ramadan that were a part of me before Ramadan. These are my three things for change. Don't let it be abstract and all over the place. No, no be very specific about the goals that you have after Ramadan, from now, and really immerse yourself in Ramadan, and uh, and thank Allah that you have it. But if you are grateful, I shall increase you. So, so we hope by saying Alhamdulillah for another Ramadan that Allah gives us another Ramadan. So Alhamdulillah for this great blessing of Ramadan, Alhamdulillah for this great blessing uh, that we have, and I pray that it becomes a source of blessing for all of us. And I pray that uh, each one of you uh, find the best version of yourself as a result of the Ramadan and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finds you in the most pleasing state to him 
uh, through this Ramadan. I pray that Allah accept all of our good deeds and forgive all of our shortcomings. And I pray that we are able to gather in this life upon good, and if not in this life, then in the next life, in the abode of eternal good. Allahumma ameen. And jazakumullah khair. I'll say this, by the way, this was the most organized event I have ever been a part of. So congratulations to the whole team, mashallah, at, uh, at QF. Um, I've been there physically. I've, I've had the opportunity to lecture there physically, and I enjoyed it. But this was just top-notch, mashallah. So may Allah reward you all, uh, the organizing team, uh, for putting this together. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmad, for your kind words and for your prayers. It has been wonderful to have you as our guest speaker for today's Ramadan edition of the Education City Speaker Series. Thank you so much for your insights and for being here with us. And we truly hope that everyone who has joined us today finds inspiration in your words as they look to be an architect of change that actually endures. And finally, thank you to all of our audience for joining us from Qatar and around the world. Remember, you can rewatch today's event on Qatar Foundation's YouTube channel. And please keep checking qf.org.qa slash slash ECSS for details of future editions of the Education City Speaker Series, which we hope you will join us for. Thank you again and have a lovely rest of the evening. Stay safe and once again, Ramadan Mubarak to you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.